bounded by the cross currents of seas. The more than 7,000 islands of this blessed land appear like primordial pearls, floating on an immaculate layer of divine azure sea basking under the golden rays of a glorious sun. These gems form one wonderful tapestry of land and sea, blessed with an endless natural beauty, phenomenal sights, wonders, and stunning landscapes, teeming with cacophony of myriad souls, sometimes discordant, sometimes harmonious, and yet all bounded together by the land and the seas. The Philippines is not a nation that had remained untouched in isolation, having withstood some of history's most difficult transitions, changes in political landscapes, eventually evolving into a wonderful mixture of cultures and traditions. It is a culmination of all those who have passed through its shores, migrants, explorers, conquerors, who came and left their influences with food, religion, and cultures, turning this land into a multifaceted nation of Filipinos. From whence came the land and its peoples? This has piqued the interest of brilliant minds, from scholars and scientists, to cultural cornerstones of indigenous communities, foremost weavers of myths and legends that produced a sheer number of Filipino creation stories. In the north, they believed it all began with the great spirit Lumawik, who descended from the sky, turning pairs of reeds into men and women, and teaching them how to speak. In the central plains, they spoke of the first man and woman emerging from a giant bamboo, split open by the pecking of the king of birds, and from whence further generations came forth. The Katutubo in the south believed creation began with the union of the sky god Kaptan with Magwayan, the goddess of the sea, with their children, Lidagat and Lihangin, and their progenies, Liadlao, Libulan, Lisuga, and Likalibutan. There were even more creation myths among the Lumad, foremost of which were stories of how the moon and the stars came to being from the comb and the beads of an old spinster pounding rice. She raised her pestle so high that it struck the sky hard, making it rise higher into the heavens along with her ornaments. Although these myths and stories originated from individual communities, the knowledge they present showcase the wholeness of these societies. They present collective psyche of a great people that has existed way before what modern history has surmised. They showcase the ancientness of our people, a prehistory that is deep and age-old, a culture that is rich venerable and profound. Pre-colonial Philippine society is culturally rich, vibrant, organized, and self-sufficient. There already exists a traditional social and economic structure, and historical evidences support this. Like any well-founded societies, authoritative figures and pillars of society rose to prominence to establish order and civility. These central figures have boundaries of specializations that are fluid and with a clear distinction in rules. First and foremost was the Datu, the local chieftain who took charge of the political and economic organization of the barangay. Although the Datu was recognized as the head of the community, he was not considered as a political leader in the modern sense. The Datu proved himself worthy of his position by blood or by merit, either through bravery, influence, or wealth. Once he proved his worth and was chosen as the Datu, people in the barangay pledged their loyalty and allegiance to him. Those with special skills in craftsmanship, science, and the arts were given importance and were thus bestowed with the title Pandai, or literally, skilled hands. These master craftsmen supervised the creation of tools, pottery, woodworks, metal crafts, and weapons. Their mastery in crafts depended on the materials they specialized in. Pandai Ginto mastered in gold smiting, while the Pandai Baka is the master blacksmith. The Pandai Anluwagi, on the other hand, was the carpenter, woodworker, and builder. The 
The people believed in immortality of the soul and in life after death. They revered and worshipped a number of gods and believed in the existence of spirits and other supernatural entities. They believed that everything that happens to their community, famine and abundance, defeat and conquest, health and sickness, were all dependent on the temper of the spirits and the gods. The Babaylan was a specially gifted individual who communicated with the spirits and interceded in behalf of the community. She was their folk therapist, the keeper of wisdom, their physical and spiritual healer, their philosopher and visionary who communicated with the spirit world for knowledge and guidance. The Babaylans were predominantly women, but there also existed Asok, biological males, who took on both the appearance and characteristics of the female Babaylan and performed the same societal function. The first priority of the Babaylan was her community. They believed that all things, all people, and all in existence were connected, working together to maintain the balance and harmony within their communities. The Bagani, as an important pillar of society, was responsible for providing defense and protection for the community and its people. They strive to maintain law and order and is responsible for keeping the peace and stability of the barangay. There can be more than one Bagani in the barangay and usually the Datu can also be a Bagani. These heroes, known for their exploits in battle, but in times of peace, they were respected not only for their martial powers, but also for their leadership skills in caring for the land and guiding the people. But in times of war, the Bagani would all raise their arms and get ready to defend the community and its people, even unto death. The people and the community prospered under the leadership and tutelage of the four pillars of society. They flourished in the manufacture and trading of various goods, benefiting in the barter between individuals or between communities. The seas were not a hindrance to these pre-colonial communities. They had superior knowledge in shipbuilding, in seafaring, enabling them to cross the oceans and reach long-distant shores to trade. Historical and archaeological evidences proved this is so. Jade beads aged from 1000 years BC was found within the Manungal cave and provided evidence of contact and trade with mainland Asia as no evidence of jade deposits were ever found in Palawan. Pottery from 6000 years BC were found in various locations in the Philippines. The design, forms, and decorations of which were similar to that being used in Japan and Burma, indicative of trade or even the transfer of knowledge in pot making. The taklobo or the giant clam was an abundant resource that was made available to the community. These clams were abundant source of food. But the people also made great use of the shells as tools, containers, bodily ornaments, burial implements, and even as sources of lime for their nganga or betel chew. The people's affinity with the sea and their familiarity with the physical shapes and forms of these giant clams inspired the people to go beyond mere rituals and other practices related to the clam. From these forms came the symbols, scripts, and syllabary that eventually developed into the Baibayan writing system. The people used these scripts to write letters, songs, and prayers. They used it for transactions in trade and businesses, agreements, and the writing of laws. These were written in various forms of materials available, leaves, bamboo, wood, tree barks, rocks, and metals. The Baibayin, however, was not relegated as a mere form of writing. The people found that these symbols and scripts were imbued with power and energy that can be channeled to grow plants or heal ailments. Baibayin scripts were written on leaves and placed on ailing parts of the body of the sick or to drive away evil spirits. Unfortunately, the onslaught of foreign invaders suppressed the use and propagation of this native script. 
The people, however, strived to maintain and keep this culture alive by incorporating by buying into artistic needlework, weaves, pottery, and religious dances, as well as integrating them into various Kali movements and earlier form of Filipino martial arts. The intrinsic need for self-preservation and for defending the people and the community led the Bagani to hone and develop their battle skills. Circumstances brought about by the threat of war, incursions of bandits and raiders, or the maintenance of stability and security during peacetime pushed the Bagani to develop forms, styles, and techniques that they could use in various combative situations. These movements were developed and preserved, which eventually led to the genesis of the Filipino martial code and art, trade, cultural, and martial exchanges with other communities, and even with other kingdoms and culture, led to further development, enhancement of styles, and improvement in martial prowess. In many communities, the professional soldier was created and developed not only for the protection and safeguarding of their territories, but for conquest as well. These soldiers have no other duty but to become pure warriors used for invasion and were sustained by taxes from the people or war loot from pillaging other communities. Many of these warriors have idealized codes of conduct. However, most of their lives and martial knowledge revolved around the invasion and killing of other people, and not in the defense of the community. The Bagani, however, was ready to defend the community without expecting compensation in return, and if need be, were all ready to give their lives in defense of their homeland. In these times of war or invasion, the Bagani raises his arms not only to defend their land and their people, but also their culture. He was more than just a warrior. He was the defender of their way of life. In the early part of the 16th century, the Spanish set sail in search of a westward route across the Pacific to the Indies. Commander Ferdinand Magellan's fleet of ships accidentally stumbled upon an unknown archipelago and on March 16, 1521, Magellan came upon the island of Samar. Magellan, however, decided that it was in his best interest to wait to attack and thus dot at a nearby island. This island was uninhabited and so Magellan's fleet took a few days off needed rest. On March 18, the Spaniards took note of a boatload of natives coming toward their ships. Commander Magellan, seeing a strange opportunity, greeted them in friendship. This friendship was to develop, and the native islanders familiarized Magellan with the names of the surrounding islands that made up the archipelago. With the assistance of the ship's priest, Magellan baptized Raha Kolambu, the chief of Sama, and also Raha Humabo, the chief of Cebu converting them to Catholicism and ultimately Spanish allegiance. On April 27, Magellan led an expedition to nearby Mactan Island in hopes of conquering it and then presenting it as a gift to Raja Humabon as he and 49 Spanish conquistadors disembarked from their ships. They were confronted by 1,050 islanders led by Raja Lapu-Lapu. The Spaniard observed that the natives practiced weapons-based martial arts. They were armed with iron-tipped, fire-hardened bamboo lances, pointed fire-dried wooden stakes, and a variety of blades wielded using circular and elliptical patterns that the Europeans weren't used to. Greatly outnumbered, Magellan was killed by Raja Lapu-Lapu and his men. In 1543, Ruy de Villalobos, sailing from New Spain, Mexico, landed south of Mindanao and proceeded to name the entire archipelago, the Philippines, after King Philip II of Spain. It was not until 1565 that Miguel López de Legazpi, authorized by Philip II, colonized the island of Cebu and a foothold was secured in the Philippines. 
When the Spaniards traveled to the island of Luzon in 1570, their arrival was confronted by Cali warriors whose fighting method far exceeded theirs. The martial art developed by these warriors exhibit extreme agility, speed, and accuracy. While the Spaniards' swords were sharp and readily cut through the natives' wooden weapons, the Cali warriors delivered strikes to nerve centers along soldiers' bodies and limbs, allowing them to disarm and disable some of the conquistadors with a flurry of attacks. However, the superior weapons and tremendous firepower of the conquistadors eventually prevailed, and the Spaniards defeated and conquered the inhabitants of Luzon. Thus began the age of colonization and suppression. The arrival of the Spaniards brought with them the paternal type of monarchy adopted and applied in Europe. This appealed to and eventually corrupted the Datu, the Bagani leaders, and even the Asog, succumbing to the misguided allures of a colonial bureaucracy. The Spanish friars also wanted to establish themselves as spiritual leaders that will pave the way to a new era of religious and political dispension. However, the natives' belief system was deeply rooted in the Babaylan, whom they believed to traverse both physical and spiritual realms. Thus, the Spanish friars viewed the Babaylan as their formidable rival. They must be destroyed. This began a campaign to demonize the Babaylan, branding them brujas or witches, and their practices condemned as evil witchcraft practices. The Babaylan, however, continued to gain support from the people as spiritual leaders. They were close to the people and were hard to suppress. Together with steadfast Datus and Baganis, the Babaylan rose up in arms and led various rebellions against the colonial invaders. But despite the early success of these revolts, they were eventually suppressed. Their Babaylan leaders captured and executed. The friars feared the spiritual prowesses of these Babaylan so much that they went for their total annihilation. They ordered the Babaylans impaled with bamboo poles from their mouths and through their genitals. They were then deliberately placed on the mouths of the rivers to be eaten by crocodiles. The crocodiles were believed to be sacred animals. So this act not only desecrated the sanctity of the Babaylan, but of the sacred animal as well. The indigenous martial art that the Spanish encountered was not yet called Eskrima at that time. Pakalikali, Didya, Kabaroan, Sitbatan, Kalirongan, Sinawali, Kalis, Pananandata, Pagaradman, and Kaliradman. They came in various forms, styles, and names. Depending on what region or part of the archipelago, the art was practiced. Colonizing the nation and suppressing its inhabitants, the Spanish colonizers eventually decreed the prohibition of the art of Cali and other native martial arts. The decree also prohibited the carrying of full-sized swords like the Cris and the Campila. This suppression, however, did not discourage the native practice of these martial arts with a dedicated few continuing to practice and perfecting the art, keeping it alive for the next generation. They traded their swords with rattan sticks or used small knives in wielding them like swords. These steadfast practitioners thrived under the watchful eyes of the Spaniards, disguising their practices in native ritual dances, like the Sakutin stick dance, Santican dance forms, and the mock battles in the Sinulog finale and the Moro Moro stage plays. Ironically, these dances and plays were performed for the enjoyment of these colonizers. Despite the efforts of the native martial art to thrive in a time of colonization and suppression, the lengthy 333 years of Spanish reign eventually left its mark in the development and evolution of the art. The influences of the Spanish rapier and dagger system, the systemic Spanish fencing techniques, angles of attack, and other martial arts influences combined with native fighting techniques paved the way for the development of Escrima and Arnis de Mano and eventually into a distinguishable Philippine martial art. The Philippine Revolution was brought about by an accumulation of new ideas 
and the exposure of an enlightened middle class and ilustrados to the international community. These new ideals and the exposure of Spanish abuses initiated the influx of nationalism and nationalistic endeavors. Eventually, waking up a suppressed people, slumbering for more than three centuries of colonial suppression. The rise of Filipino nationalism was slow, but inevitable. It, however, paved the way for a united Filipino people to finally seek for freedom. Some modern historians surmised that the battles won by Philippine revolutionaries against the Spaniards were won by guns, particularly the Mauser rifles bought by Aguinaldo and his Hong Kong junta with a hefty sum earned from the Pact of Biak na Bato. Many of these battles, however, were hard fought with blades playing a large part. These brave natives would rush in and engage the enemy in close quarter combat, slashing with their bolo, para and other heavy knives. They would charge in unexpectedly against the ranks of Spanish riflemen, hacking at them while they were still in the act of reloading their rifles. These amazing displays explain why troops with rifles and bayonets are driven back and subdued by men armed only with knives. Some revolutionaries were equipped with guns, but most of the Spanish casualties succumbed from knife wounds. The United States eventually went to war with Spain over Cuba. The Filipinos, with Aguinaldo at the helm, sided with the Americans, believing that Spain's defeat to the U.S. would lead to a free Philippines. They were wrong. Aguinaldo returned from exile on board an American warship. With his return, a renewed uprising quickly overwhelmed Spanish garrisons across the country, except for a few remaining strongholds. He eventually declared independence of the Philippine Islands and became its first president. Under the banners of a new republic, the revolutionaries pushed towards the penultimate prize, Manila, and towards independence. And so they thought. But Spain will not surrender to the rebels. They will never surrender to the Indios in a secret negotiation with the Americans, who also had a different agenda. The Spanish defenders engaged the Americans in mock battle and after a few sporadic fire, surrendered the city. The scarlet and gold flag that flew over Manila for 300 years was replaced, not by the newly designed Philippine flag, but by the star and stripes of Uncle Sam. The U.S. never really intended to recognize the new Philippine government. It was the end of 300 years in a convent for the Filipinos, but was sadly replaced by 50 years of Hollywood. Thus began a bitter war between the Philippines and the United States. The American soldiers experienced the intensity and ferocity of Filipino martial arts. Bola wielding guerrillas from Balangiga attacked and overwhelmed an American company, killing many and leaving the rest seriously injured. In Mindanao, despite emptying his .38 long cold caliber revolver on a charging Moro warrior, an American serviceman still ended up decapitated by his attacker. Similar incidents prompted the American military to develop a pistol with more stopping power, the .45 caliber Colt M1911. This bitter war raged on and continued past the turn of the century claiming the lives of 40,000 Filipinos and 4,000 American soldiers, with as many as 200,000 Filipino civilians dying from violence, famine, and disease. The war ended after the eventual capture of Aguinaldo in the Declaration of Allegiance to the United States. Although post-war conflicts existed in isolated parts of the nation, the Philippines entered a period of recovery under the U.S. administration, which they declared as only temporary. Commissions established by the U.S. acknowledged Filipino aspirations for independence, but lacked the institutions that will usher in the establishment of a free and democratic government. These include the establishment of a bicameral legislature, autonomous governments on the provincial and municipal levels, and a new system of free public schools. The issue was not whether the Philippines would be granted self-rule, but when and under what conditions. With the approval of the Tidings-McDuffie Act, 
or the Philippines Independence Act of 1934. The Philippines was set for self-government and independence after a period of 10 years. But World War II happened, and the Japanese invaded our shores. To prevent its destruction, Manila was declared an open city and was eventually occupied by the Japanese. Under the pressure of a superior Imperial Japanese Army, Naval and Air Forces, the defending U.S. Philippine forces withdrew to Bataan and made their last stand in the island of Corregidor. More than 80,000 prisoners of war were forced to march to a prison camp 105 kilometers to the north in what will infamously be called the Bataan Death March, claiming the lives of thousands of these unsung heroes. After occupation, the Japanese military immediately began organizing a new government structure and a council of state that directed civil affairs. Eventually, collaboration in puppet government was established with most of the Philippine elite serving under the Japanese. To control the public, the Japanese formed the Bureau of Constabulary, the secret police force Ken Peitai, and the Makabayang Katipunan ng mga Pilipino better known as the Makapili. These groups arrested those who were suspected of being anti-Japanese. Despite the Japanese campaigns against them, American and Filipino troops who refused to surrender flourished and formed the Philippine guerrilla movement and vowed to fight the Japanese. Many of these guerrilla fighters fought the Japanese in hand-to-hand -hand combat, armed only with blades. Some, like the Tabak Division or Bolo Batalyon, were official military units serving under the USA FFV. Some of the Filipino martial art grandmasters, who are known to have used their skills in World War II, are Antonio Ilustrisimo, Benjamin Luna Lema, Leo Giron, Teodoro Doring Saavedra, brothers Eulogio, and Cacoy Cañete, Timoteo Timor Maranga Sr., Jesus Bayas, and Balbino Tortal Bongancisco. These arnisadors and the rest of the guerrilla fighters dealt crucial and efficient blows to the Japanese military. Their tactics were so effective that by the end of the war, only 12 of the 48 provinces of the Philippines were controlled by the Japanese Empire. The Philippine guerrilla movement persisted and pushed on with their fight against the Japanese, gathering information and formulating plans to assist the return of American forces. They built stashes of guns, radios, supplies, and explosives smuggled to them under clandestine submarine operations. They made plans of sabotaging Japanese communication lines in preparation for MacArthur's return and invasion. That time came and they attacked the Japanese forces from the rear. The campaign to retake the Philippines, however, was the bloodiest of the Pacific War, and the Japanese Imperial General Staff decided to make the Philippines their final line of defense against American advancement toward Japan. This culminated the Battle of Manila, a month-long battle that took the lives of 100,000 civilians and the destruction of architectural and cultural heritage. It was the scene of the worst urban fighting in the Pacific War, resulting in the complete devastation of the city. But from the ashes of destruction will rise new hope for the Philippines. This Allied victory signified the end of Japanese military rule in the country and the breakdown of Axis forces in the Philippines. It also heralded the restoration of the Philippine Commonwealth, culminating in the recognition of the Philippine independence and the relinquishment of American sovereignty over the Philippine Islands.
During the war, the efficiency and intensity shown by practitioners of Filipino martial arts among the freedom fighter caught the attention and admiration of several American special operations groups. After the war, some of these practitioners migrated to Hawaii and the U.S., paving the way for the art form to reach an even bigger global arena. The Philippines and its people have survived some of the harshest and most difficult transitions in history, like gold tested in fire. The presence of such conflicts has no doubt helped practitioners of Filipino martial arts to hone and further improve their skills and their art. It is often said that Filipino martial arts is a vicious and dangerous form of self-defense and is definitely not a compassionate art form. Over the years, hundreds of unique styles emerged throughout the archipelago, each beset with their own level of controversies as to their origins and development of key system elements. But despite the seemingly lack of coherence and organization among these mirrored styles, there is still the presence of a central theme among these Filipino martial art forms. There may be subtle differences in the techniques and system used, but the overall fighting concepts of discipline and the determination to win remain the same. As a result, lasting friendship among the masters and practitioners flourished despite the differences in their art forms, traditions, locations, and even languages. Such camaraderie and cooperation led to further development and enhancements of their individual styles and the Filipino martial arts system as a whole. In recent years, the practice of Filipino martial arts has become more systematized, making it easier to learn. Emphasis is placed on the student's ability to learn and progress, which now proved as a weightier factor in their advancement in ranks, rather than the length of time they've spent in class. The basics remain the same, focusing on the three key elements of fluidity, rhythm, and timing, continuously learning these flowing skills until such time as the smooth flowing transitions from one movement to next is simply second to nature to the practitioner. On top of that, FMA practitioners are also nurtured in the physical and spiritual aspects of their arts. Respect for their masters and their instructors is emphasized, as well as respect for other FMA schools and clubs and other practitioners of the art regardless of their styles and art forms. In December 11, 2009, Arnis was declared as the Philippine National Martial Art and Sport through Republic Act No. 9850, authored by Senator Juan Miguel F. Zubiri and signed into law by President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. On the 12th of January, 2017, the first National Arnis Congress was convened at the Philippine Red Cross Multipurpose Hall in Mandaluyong City. The Arnis Congress elected Senator Mig Zubiri as its interim chairman and authorized him to appoint and constitute the 15 members of the interim board. Senator Zubiri appointed the interim board of trustees of PECA from the mother and major Arnis organizations and styles in the country representing Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, and the NCR, namely Senator Juan Miguel F. Zubiri, Chairman, Makbakan International, Calis Ilustrisimo, Metro Manila, Grandmaster Felipe Taik A. Abelia Jr., Stick Fighter Society, Abelia Escrima Lapunti Arnis de Abanico International, Cebu City. Grandmaster Efren L. Apresto. Filipino Arts Modified Arnis Federation, Sultan Kudara. Chairman Patty Jean Luna Caballero, Lightning Scientific Arnis International, Manila. Master Gerald O. Cañete, Dose Paris. Cebu City. Grandmaster Samuel Bambit D. Dulay, Modern Arnis Tapi Tapi, Quezon City. Senior Master Richardson Gialogo, Camao. Grandmaster Danilo S. Horquilla, 
Lapundi Arnis de Abanico International, Cebu City. Grandmaster, Generoso June Malte Martinada Jr., National Arnis Association of the Philippines, Leaping Maharlika, Laguna. Grandmaster, Mario Carsonite Palazuelo, Kapatiran Doble Olisi Escrima, Davao City. Miss Bella Marie Pichi Baron Sagi, Calis Illustrissimo, Philippines. Former Mayor Bernard Butch A. Sepulveda, World Escrima Balintawak Arnis Federation, Cebu Province. Grandmaster René Rosales Tonson, Classical Arnis Abanico Tres Puntas International Federation, Cavite Province. Dr. Paulo Mutita, President of IMAF. Tuhon Romel P. Tortal, Pequite Tircia, Cali International, Bacolod City. Mr. Ike Javier S. Villaflores, Duma Escrima International, Dumaguete City. The Philippine Escrima Cali Arnis Federation, with its 13 members, was formally convened on February 15, 2017. On July 20, 2017, the PECAF Board of Trustees took their oath of office before Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdia at the Malacanang Palace in Manila. On the same day, the installation and oath-taking of the 28-member PECAF was held at the Pan Pacific Hotel in Ermita, Manila. The PECAF Council of Elders is an advisory body composed of respected and known Arnis Grand Masters from different Arnis organizations and styles throughout the country. PECAF aims to create a more inclusive sports organization that will be non-discriminatory and more proactive in spreading the sport in martial art by supporting the various grassroots program of the Philippine Sports Commission, the Department of Education, and the Philippine Olympic Committee, and the Arnis training and coaching programs of the Philippine Sports Institute and various local government units. It can be said that the development of Filipino martial arts parallels the development and history of the Philippines and its people. Alas, a lot of history and other knowledge recorded in writing has been lost before the 1900s. What we now know as precious knowledge, taught and passed on by masters and teachers of the art, to the select few of the next generation, those who are deserving of such knowledge and training. We are thankful and lucky that in these modern times, there are masters who are concerned with the promoting and upholding the Filipino culture, selflessly sharing their art forms, particularly to the younger generation, the future of our nation. For showing the public and the world that we Filipinos have a martial art discipline and art that we can call our own. Masters, we salute you.